Good morning, I'm Matt Galloway. You're listening to The Current. Still to come, our national affairs panel will decode the government's messaging going into month two of this pandemic. Yes, indeed, it is the 1st of April. But first, congratulations, everyone. Whether you know it or not, you may be part of the biggest home learning experiment in history. Here's something you're probably getting familiar with right now. Adaptation. No matter who you are or where you are in this country, you're most likely adjusting to a new normal, a new way of doing things, parenting, working, socializing. This is especially true for teachers across this country. Teachers are dealing with a pretty hard responsibility right now. They are figuring out how to continue educating their students while everyone is in self-isolation. Anna Ramirez is a kindergarten and grade one teacher in Burnaby, British Columbia. Amy Sherminska teaches grade nine and 12 in Barrie, Ontario. And Craig Morgan teaches grade seven and eight in Toronto. Good morning to you all. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How is everyone doing? Craig, we'll start with you. These are uh, strange times, to put it bluntly, and life for you in terms of work and the relationships that you would have with your students uh, are uh, in a different place right now. How are you holding up? Uh, We're doing all right. Uh, We've been spending the last week just trying to reconnect with our students. Uh, When we left just before March break, we really had no idea what the future held. We thought we'd be back uh, in a few weeks, and that quickly... uh, change to uh, the end of the end of April right now. Uh, so we're just trying to reconnect with our students and make them feel uh, comfortable and keep that sense of consistency in their learning. Amy, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Um, similar to Craig, I've been reconnecting with my students, which has been great. Um, they have a lot of questions. Their parents have questions. And um, we are slowly figuring out what the answers to those questions are. I want to talk about those questions and the answers in a moment. Anna, for you, what, what, how are things? Um, pretty much the same, yeah. Well, we were sort of lucky that we just came back from spring break, so we got two weeks to sort of try to distance ourselves and try to think how we're going to figure this out. And, yeah, so we just started this week back, uh, again, just checking in with our communities, our families, um, and, yeah, trying to give our students a little bit of that sense of normal- normalcy. What are you doing this week to try to prepare for whatever is going to unfold in in the weeks ahead, Craig? Uh, For the last week or so, we've been building uh, a lot of platforms like Google Classroom and then trying to get our students connected on it. I teach almost 200 students, so it's been a bit of a challenge to connect with all of them. What is, just for people who don't use it, just briefly explain what Google Classroom is. Uh, Google Classroom is just, it's a learning platform that allows uh, a teacher or teachers to connect with uh, one or multiple students. We can post information, we can post assignments, students can ask questions, they can have conversations amongst themselves. It's creating a a false classroom. You're not in a face-to-face, but you still have that opportunity to uh, discuss items with each other. Amy, what are you doing? Um, Well, we've had a couple of um, staff meetings to discuss uh, what's happening. Um, I also had the pleasure of connecting with some other grade 12 chemistry teachers from around Ontario yesterday. Um, A Toronto teacher, Julie Vandermeer, reached out on social media, so that was really great. Um, We're really trying to evaluate what are the most important um, things that we want our students to learn if they're going to continue learning, and what can they demonstrate at a distance. And we really need to have conversations and lean on each other um, to help find answers to those questions. So what, what, what came out of that discussion? When you take a look at what students need, but also how you can work together, what, what was the result of that discussion? Um, well, it, it's fabulous because we can share resources with one another. Um, different teachers have um, different levels of experience when it comes to doing um, some kinds of online learning. Um, so some teachers have used more, it, for instance, in our case, um, we can't do labs anymore. We won't be able to as- assess students' lab skills. So there are some teachers who have some great ideas and resources about how we can um, look at some of those curriculum expectations online through simulations and things like that. So um, it was really great. Um, the resource sharing is fantastic. 
What do you think the, the classroom or whatever it is that you're creating, Anna, is going to look like? You are working uh, and teaching with young, young kids. I mean, these are yeah. kindergarten kids, grade one kids, and this is their first time being in a classroom with a lot of other students often. What is what you're creating yeah, um, going to look like? Yeah, I believe that um, for, I mean, it's obviously a challenge for everyone, but um, in the case of early primary specifically, we have another layer um, added to that. We have students who have not been exposed to really using computer or being online. Um, so we have started to brainstorm um, a lot of um, tools that we can use. Uh, we're really um, grateful we're a district. They have begun to develop a website for mm -hmm. parents to use. Um, they're calling it the continuing learning website, and they have started to post um, activities by grade level to suggest and help parents. Um, however, as a teacher, um, we are just trying to find an array of tools that will be available for our parents. Um, I currently actually use um, a platform called FreshGrade. Um, so FreshGrade allows you to create digital portfolios. I was lucky that I set up those ahead of time, well, just as a way to complement um, my practice in the classroom, show the parents what we were doing, um, showcase my students' work. So now that that is set up, I'm really thankful for that. And it's another layer that I can use to communicate with the parents, post little videos for my students, little activities. That's just one of the many tools that we'll have to use to make sure that we keep trying to make their learning as hands-on, engaging, and even play-based as it is in the early learning so years. So there are different approaches to this because some teachers at, at different levels perhaps are going to be engaging with students through video chat or what have you. They'll be doing a lab mm -hmm. uh, online. When you're dealing with, with younger kids like that, it's more this is what we were doing in the classroom and then you turn it over to the parents. Is that what you're saying? Um, no, completely. I mean, of course, because they are younger, we will um, need a certain degree of um, support from the parents that perhaps you don't need with older grades. Just because they are more independent, they can go online. Um, in my case, for example, my kids are just beginning to read and write. Mm. So um, I want to make sure that I can offer the parents a um, as much as I can in terms of, for example, if I can send maybe a video with instructions yeah. or even me teaching. Um, but for sure it will be a, a greater challenge that um, it might be with older kids who, who will be more independent, right? Craig, for you, you're teaching grade 7, grade 8. We got a better sense from the Ontario government as to what the next little bit is going to look like in terms of a structure for uh, at-home or online learning, um, in terms of uh, time expectations for students, but also the fact that the work that they do will be graded. What did you make of, of what the, the Ontario government announced yesterday? Uh, it was... Um interesting for us uh, just because I know we've, we've even had messages from our director and uh, people are trying to figure out what that's going to look like now. Obviously when we're evaluating in the classroom it's a little bit different than when we're evaluating online. Uh, I think one of the struggles that we're going to have is that we know students learn differently. Some of them need to do hands-on activities, some need to collaborate with others, some are happy reading and now we have them doing online learning and it's going to be very difficult to try to assess all of their different talents uh, and that's going to be something that we're going to have to obviously judge as we go along. Uh, I think our first week when we get back to things starting on Monday we're going to throw stuff at them and then we'll have to see how they respond, how we respond and then adjust what we're doing to make sure that they all have an opportunity to be successful. Amy, what happens with some of the students you work with uh, that have special needs and perhaps additional challenges? How, how are they meant to cope with this? Oh, um, my students are dealing with a number of different challenges. In my grade 9 class, I have um, a wide variety of um, learning needs, and I usually work with a couple of EAs in the classroom to support those students. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to have to figure out on a case-by-case -case basis how we can support them with their learning at home. Um, with my grade 12s, uh, in my communication with them, I've discovered some of them are currently working almost full-time hours at grocery stores. So they're maybe not in a situation where they have the ability to engage in their learning. Um, we, we have to make sure that students have access to what they need to learn. But what we can't control are the, the other factors, right? Do they have a quiet space? Do they have some family support? 
are they, is their mental health okay? Like, are they in, in a place where they can learn? Um, we've got a lot of things we're dealing with. Um, I did take heart in the minister's um, press conference. He did say that we would be grading, but I listened very carefully, and he said, with appropriate flexibility. Yeah. So we're going to be using our professional judgment, as we always do, and looking at our students as individuals and making sure that whatever we put in place isn't going to be unfairly penalizing students who don't have access to what they need. Another issue I wanted to mention briefly is I, I have a couple of students who are English language learners, so I need to figure out how am I going to communicate with them so that they can access um, the curriculum material. What does that say about the expectations that we all should have? These are extraordinary times, and the students should be in the class, they're not in the class, um, people have called this online learning. Other f folks have called this at-home learning. What are the expectations that we should have about what we are engaging in? Amy? Um, I think we need to be really flexible. So we, we need to be flexible with our expectations with teachers. Um, many of our teachers have young kids at home and may not be able to engage with their students. Um, the same way that others would. We have teachers in our uh, school board who live in rural areas and don't have access to technology. Um, they don't have a great internet connection. Um, and we have to extend that flexibility to our students. So what's happening right now has never happened before. Yeah. We know that the learning the students are going to get is not going to be the same as what they would get during a regular semester. And we're going to have to be creative. Do your, do your grade 12 students worry, and I want to get to, to Craig and, and Anna in a moment, but do your grade 12 students worry that given that this is not normal learning, they're going to be heading out of a post-secondary, out of a secondary school into perhaps post-secondary school? Do they worry that they won't be as equipped as they would have been had things been usual? Um, they are certainly worried about that, um, and all we can do is reassure them, and I can do the best that I can to give them the most important skills they need going forward. However, I know that the post-secondary institutions have a great understanding of what's going on. They are dealing with the same things. I have uh, friends that teach in university and in college, and they know that they're, they're going to have a great understanding of the challenges we are facing because they have faced them with the end of their semesters as well. So I think that they will be treating those students um, with the same grace and compassion that we would like to treat them with now. Craig, I wonder whether your grade 8 students have the same anxiety. Yeah, I'm, I've noticed that uh, when I've been trying to reconnect uh, with the uh, grade 7 and 8 students, the grade 7 students have been a bit of a struggle. They were like, okay, that's great, where the grade 8s have been very appreciative, had many thank yous that I've offered to continue their learning for them. Uh, I know as they're heading into high school in the next, they've essentially got three months of uh, middle school left, yeah. and then heading off to grade 9, they're obviously nervous. Uh, that they're going to be properly prepared when they get to high school. It's obviously a big step for them. Uh, I'm not overly concerned. I know a lot of them have already laid down that good foundation, but they obviously want to make sure they have the skill set so that they can be successful in high school and as well. Anna, you're at the other end of the spectrum where you have yeah. kids who, I mean, so much of, of being in the classroom when you're in kindergarten or grade one is just learning how to socialize. Exactly, yeah. The piece of the socio-emotional learning is huge. So one of the things that I am really um, trying to figure out is how to give my students um, a piece of um, continuancy um, for that, for their socio-emotional learning. It is amazing, just as um, Greg was mentioning, like his um, students are uh, maybe anxious and everything. Same with the little ones, right? Um, before we went on spring break, I actually talked to my students. I addressed their questions. They were, they hear everything, right? Yeah. They're little sponges that they the, um, they watch the news, they hear maybe what their parents and their families are saying, their concerns, their their own worries about their own family. So I got to witness um, with my own students, again, five, six years old, um, how they were anxious and how they were nervous and just having that level of uncertainty just really hypens all that. Um, it was actually quite sad that I, um, in my mind, I was like, okay, uh, take care, wash your hands, be kind, I'll see you in two weeks, everything mm. will be okay. I understand that the situation outside um, is escalating, but we got this, right? So now knowing that I, I won't go back, I'm not back in the classroom, um, it's really difficult for sure. You're all teachers and your parents as well. And so in the remaining few seconds that we have, and I just want to do this very quickly, I'll start with you. Um, Anna, what's one word of advice that you would give 
parents as they try to navigate this new world? Patients. Um, I know that this is a new situation for them as well. Um, I know a lot of parents are putting a lot of um, um, anxiety on their own. Yeah. Um, how are they going to teach their kids? So just be patient with yourself, be kind with yourself. Amy, briefly from you. Help. Um, I will echo patience. Um, I, I also think it's really important that we listen to each other. So listen to your kids. Um, make sure that they're okay. That's the most important thing. They can't learn if they're not okay. Craig, a word of advice for parents. Uh, I'm going to go with the patience again. 100% agree, but also finish off just love and kindness towards everybody. Good luck to all of you. This is... Um an adventure that we're all on together. Uh, I appreciate you uh, speaking with us, and your students will appreciate the work that you're doing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anna Ramirez teaches kindergarten and grade one in Burnaby, British Columbia. Craig Morgan teaches grade seven and eight in Toronto, and Amy Sherminska teaches grade nine and 12 in Barrie, Ontario. Michael Barber is an associate professor who focuses on using technology in education for more than two decades. He has been researching how provinces and territories in Canada are using online and distance learning. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning. What do you make of what you've heard from those teachers? Um, well, if all the teachers across the country are approaching this with the same sort of mindset that uh, these three individuals were, I think we'll probably be in good stead. I mean, they seem to be going into it with uh, their eyes wide open, but at the same time with a, a sense of optimism that this is something that they're going to figure out. You've called this a triage situation. What do you mean by that? Well, obviously, we're in a, an emergency situation here. I mean, this is a pandemic. No one expected that schools were going to close, and in all likelihood, will stay closed for the remainder of the school year. So uh, we're scrambling. And um, in any emergency situation, when you triage it, you're essentially just trying to stabilize the system, which is, I think, what our immediate concerns are right now in terms of, say, the next two to six weeks. You know, how do we get it to a place where people are at least starting to feel some level of comfort and some level of normal normalcy when it comes to how things are operating because this is something that we're going to have to deal with for at least the rest of the school year I would imagine and potentially into next school year. What do you think the, the main challenges will be that teachers will face? We heard three teachers there talking about what they're up against. More broadly, what do you think teachers will be facing? Well, the biggest challenge I would suggest is that the students that they're working with, and for that matter, the teachers themselves, you know, everyone is accustomed to and used to learning in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, with, say, Amy as an example, you know, her grade 10 students have had now almost 11 full years of experience on how to learn effectively in a face-to-face -face classroom setting. And now all of a sudden we're asking them with really next to no notice whatsoever to learn how to learn in a completely different environment. And there's going to be a, a drop there. And um, how we essentially train them how to be effective in this environment, um, both from a student perspective on how do I learn when I don't have all of the trappings of the classroom around me, to the teachers as well. Um, most teachers in not just Canada, but in most countries, mm. uh, they may get a single course in their uh, teacher preparation program on technology integration. None of them would have experienced a course, um, you know, online pedagogy and and how to design and develop online instruction. Um, so trying to, you know, put all of this together, I think, is the biggest challenge. And then there's the obvious ones that we think of, you know, there are students that have special needs that uh, require additional supports, that oftentimes have additional personnel in the classroom to provide those supports that now they're not there. We've got students that don't have technology at home, don't have adequate bandwidth. Even those that do have technology at home, oftentimes mom and or dad are also working at home now, and how many computers does the average Canadian household have? Yeah. Um, you know, if both mom and dad work, they both need computers during the day, what's the, the students going to do? That's assuming you just have one child. If you had, say, three children, all of a sudden you need three or four computers to be able to accomplish this. This helps shape 
question around expectations. This isn't going to be school as people understand it. So what's reasonable, perhaps, for parents to expect in this situation? Um, well, I think that's going to vary, really, depending upon grade level and even depending upon courses and jurisdictions. Um, I think initially starting off, the main expectation would be just to establish some routines for these children. Um, they're used to getting up in the morning and, and getting on a bus and, and going to school and being there from 9 to 3 or 8 to 5. What does that look like when everyone is at home? Um, so establishing those kinds of routines and figuring out um, – when we do things, scheduling things out, when am I supposed to be online, when am I supposed to be doing hands-on things that my teacher has gotten. Um, if teachers are calling students, and I know many, particularly those with their technology aren't, you know, when are those things scheduled in on a regular basis? But, um, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out the term you use, you know, this is going to be the new normal for a while. What does that normal look like and how quickly can I get into a routine that makes us at least feel somewhat normal? We heard Amy talking about her grade 12 students and concerns that they might have that they aren't going to be fully prepared for post-secondary education because their school year has been interrupted. Is that a, a genuine concern, a legitimate concern? It is a valid concern. I mean, for sure there are curriculum outcomes, learning objectives that um, each of the ministries have added to courses that they think it's important for a well-rounded high school graduate to know that may not be things that are absolutely necessary for a student that's entering into the post-secondary environment to have. And it would behoove our ministries right now to start sitting down with their curriculum right off the bat and trying to figure out which learning outcomes are not vitally important at every grade level mm. for what the students are going to have to face in the fall and communicating that to the teachers right away so that they can focus upon those things that are vitally important. Um, but as uh, I think it was Amy had noted, universities are finding themselves in this exact same position, and they understand that the graduating students that are coming to them are coming to them in a really extraordinary circumstances. And in much the same way that come September, schools are going to have to adjust things to accommodate the fact that the end of this school year didn't go the way it would normally go. Universities are going to have to adjust what they do for their first year students come the fall to make those same accommodations. Let's spend just, we have a minute or so left. Let me uh, just ask you uh, advice and again, one word of advice for people who are in the midst of this and start with teachers. What's a word of advice that you would give the teachers as they're trying to move forward in this? Um, the first thing I would say is that as you go into the next week or two, mm. the content isn't important at this stage. Establishing the relationships that you've built up over the last eight months, six months with your students, having them experience the tools that you and, and your colleagues have chosen to use, that's really the, the key up front, yeah. making everyone sort of feel comfortable and secure. For parents, one word of advice to them? Um, students are used to having a, a sense of routine and a sense of schedule, and if there's any way possible that you can establish that within your household, even if it doesn't look like what a traditional school day would look like, that sense of pattern and routine for the student is going to help them during this, this time. And what about for the students, just very briefly? Um, in all honesty, I think the students are probably the best equipped for this because they tend to be the most flexible. Um, they tend to be the ones that can adjust what it is they're doing uh, the easiest. But at the same time, I think I'd say to them that everybody that's in this situation has them at the heart of all of their decisions. And everything that we're doing at this point is to try to ensure mm. that they are not disadvantaged. Michael, great to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Barber, an assistant professor in education at Turo University in California. Parents, students, teachers, we'd love to hear from you. How are you dealing with the new normal when it comes to education? Homeschooling? Taking a bit of a break? 
Are you worried about what's happening? You can let us know. Reach us through the website, cbc.ca slash the current. Click on the contact link. 